All right. We're going to talk about the gray man concept, the gray man, what it is. It's a question I get asked a lot. I think I'm always going to be asked this question quite a bit, to be completely honest with you. So I thought I would do another retelling of it. I also, for those that have watched the previous episode, had some technical difficulties. So I'm using this opportunity to see if those recreate themselves or not, which I'm hoping they don't. So if this stays up and you're seeing it after the live show, then you know it worked. So the whole gray man thing comes from espionage. I don't know exactly when the term started being used, but it comes from the idea of the blending of black and white being in the middle, being less noticeable. Black and white are the polar opposite extremes in color, and there's so many ways to look at it. Just There's different kinds of sayings. Living in the gray, people live in a black and white world. They see things as black and white. I was always accused of that of myself, but I never actually was that way. It was just the process of coming up to a decision. If I didn't change my mind, I was told I lived in a black and white world, which wasn't the case. Really, if you look back at recent history, it goes into places such as, if we'll go back to, say, World War II, when modern espionage really took off, you had the OSS, uh, Office of Strategic Services here in the United States. You had the SOE in Britain, Special Operation Executive, and there's many others, of course, and both sides had intel assets. What they started doing was taking regular people, and they weren't just regular, actually. A lot of them were in Ivy League or schools or other colleges. Some of them were wealthy or from wealthy families, educated in specific skills, languages, math, sciences, had appealing factors that were hard to just train an agent on. And they recruited him into the OSS. Now, there actually was another organization's name, I don't remember, that did the recruiting. The OSS didn't actually exist yet. And from that group, they created the OSS, and then they sent them to places like Canada and trained, which was in Special Operations Executive School. They had schools all over. I had mentioned before, I wasn't sure if Canadians had been there. Actually, the Ministry of Defense in Canada wasn't even aware that that school was there at the time, according to history. And they trained them on all kinds of skills, hand-to-hand fighting, using weapons, explosives, communication, ciphering, encoded messages, sabotage, intelligence gathering, working with groups of people. And that's what they put them through. And the idea was they were going to put them into the war. And so they went over, the OSS guys working with SOE, to go in and work behind enemy lines, to work with insurgent groups of people, the underground people, all the guys there that weren't actively in the military. They worked with the military a little bit, collecting intelligence. And it developed from there into a follow-on idea when places like CIA get created. CIA and NSA were the first two big intelligence agencies. They wanted to take more people like this that had other trainings and skills the government couldn't provide, bring them into the service, train them, enhance their spy skills, as they're called, and then start placing them in assignments, some of which could be living around the world abroad. While they could be working out of an office, some of them worked by themselves or in small groups, living in a location as though they belonged there. They had cover identities, cover jobs. That was the being in the gray. It was clandestine meaning nobody knew what they were really doing, but they weren't hidden. They were in plain sight. They had regular jobs, businesses, and this goes on for a long time. And that's where the whole idea of the gray man comes from. The term gray man concept and gray man theory, they're interchangeable. I prefer concept myself based on the definitions of the words. You can look those up. Theory is more than just practical application of science and determining those things. It has to do with the thinking process. Concept, I think, is a better definition. That's why I use that term. But they both mean essentially the same thing. Some people have asked about the spelling of gray, whether it's spelled with an A or an E. Well, at the end of the day, the spelling with an E is more what's done in England, in their version of English. Whereas here we spell with an A. That's why I use an A. Like I've been recently watching a Canadian comedy show and they say a lot of words differently. Like they don't say math for the subject. They say maths is in plural. There's a lot of differences like that. So that's all the the spelling is. The whole concept idea and what I do with this show is try to bring that to every people, everyday people, to figure out how to apply it to their lives, which is why I put in the description things about like emergency preparedness or counterintelligence and situational awareness. Part of what the training provides goes that deep. It really depends on the level you're at. It falls in the world of what we call human intelligence, where the primary mission is for those individuals to work with people to get information. That generally falls in three categories. One is what's called contacts. They're basically what we see in movies. You go and talk to somebody. You get information from them. They probably don't know who you are. 
If you ever turn them into an asset, that means you're recruiting them, they know who you are, you're probably putting them on the payroll, and they could even become spies themselves. Those are the people that are being told what to do by what we call their handler. So you could have a human intelligence asset, case officer in the CIA, they could be handling an asset, but they could that case officer could have their own handler, will have their own handler at the CIA, some sort of supervisor handler all the time or maybe for a specific mission. The other thing we hear about that people don't always attribute to human intelligence is interrogation, talking to people that have been detained, arrested, or whatever their legal status is in order to get more information. Typically, the focus is to stop things from happening that are happening or more likely will happen. The other type is called debriefing, which is a little bit different and is actually more classified than the other programs. You can find out all the basics on interrogation the military teaches that most of the agencies use now online. Source operations, the sources, what we call our contacts. There are classified aspects to how it's played out, the things that you do, things to start diving in in tradecraft. There's basic levels of what you call tradecraft at low levels of human intelligence like the military, but they don't call it tradecraft, but it is classified. Debriefing has to do with talking to different types of people that are likely going to be exposed to information and getting them to agree to talk to you after the fact, where we sensitize them if we do that, but we try not to. Sensitize means give them a general idea of what we're looking for, but we try not to do that in debriefing. We basically keep it down and dirty of, hey, you're taking this trip. You're going to this meeting. We'd like to talk to you afterwards, see if there's anything we might find of value. But we don't tell them anything specific about what we're looking for because we don't want them going out and doing anything or trying to obtain information for us because they're going to get caught. Another one has to do with certain types of foreign nationals that have experience in the past, may or may not have current contacts, probably don't, that could share information. So there could be a situation where they find a former military officer from another country and they agree to speak with us about whatever that we want to ask questions about. Debriefing targets, as we call them, tend to be on the radar, sometimes for years, sometimes passed off to multiple handlers. Regular contacts could also be for years in the military sense. They could be passed off. Some of them are short. If you have assets, they'll be paid employees. Interrogation just depends on how long you have them for. So that's kind of the overview of what they do and how that works out. And that's kind of the overall mission and it focuses solely on people so that being said oh we we have people out here let's see how you're doing david is it more common now to carry a tactical backpack in this city than an osprey nebula for example osprey nebula is that another type of backpack or bag what kind of bag is that um tactical backpack i guess tactical depends on what you mean it by or how it looks is it you know camouflage has it got molly straps bags i carry i carry what looks like a common everyday bag Guys that actually do this in the business, they have special contracts with companies and make very high-end bags only for the government that if they were on the open market would probably cost several hundred dollars. And they carry different types of bags. I have backpacks that I carry that are regular everyday packs. I also I have two of those, and I have two different messenger bags that I carry just out of habit depending on what I need them for. Really, it's like anything. You know, what is it for? Is it functional? Is it durable? Why does it matter what it looks like? I get if you're in the city somewhere and you're wearing camouflage or a camouflage bag, it's going to stand out. Whereas if you're on a military base and you're wearing anything other than camouflage or typically a black bag, it's going to stand out. That's why they have rules about that. Soldiers in uniform don't carry Hello Kitty. You know, so it just depends. Uh, How common it is depends on the area and what you need it for. Part of what I should explain about this too is when you watch or listen to anybody talk about gray man stuff, what they think gray man is, most of them are on the right track. The problem is they all say the same thing and stop at one thing and that's your appearance, how you look. Because I always say it's about blending into your environment. People equate that to like a city or, you know, a desert, the snow, the jungle. Environment is more than that. It's Where are you going to be? What's that environment? What's the meeting you're going to be in? Why are you in that town? How familiar with it? People you're going to interact with. There's so many more facets to it. While your appearance matters, it doesn't matter long. Most people don't pay attention to anything outside of 6 to 24 inches of the person most of the time. And even when they do notice something, it's very brief. 
most of what people remember has to do with noticeable interactions. Most people don't pay attention to how many cars drive by, what color, what types they are, but the second they get in a wreck and they stand there and watch it, then they take notice. Even if they don't consciously try to remember what vehicles there are, it's noticeable. So you can think of it in that sense. You're walking down the street, you see cars driving by. The overall concept of those cars driving by are somewhat gray unless you're looking for something specific. We don't pay attention to them. Then something stands out like a car wreck. Now, that being said, if you look at the shirt I'm wearing now, the color isn't that bad. I'm in Arizona in the summer. It's not that bad, but I've got the noticeable Under Armour thing on there, but I get away with it here following how I live because so many people wear stuff like this. It's it's not a normal. I tell people you can dress like a clown and be a gray man. You just need to be at the circus or you'd be doing a kid's birthday party. So it's rare. I've talked to a guy who was in a wheelchair, tried to help him out with certain areas. The thing to understand is you can't do it 100% of the time all the time. That's just not realistic. You know, we used to all see those people at Walmart videos and pictures and how ridiculous some of those people are. But, you know, in a sense, depending on how many of them are there, somewhat that has become accepted as how it is. Now, I haven't seen any crazy stuff at my Walmart, but I've seen plenty of people in pajamas and flip-flops. And at the right time of day, that's kind of the norm. So being gray is about blending in with the norm. So think of it as the norm, not the environment. What's the norm? What's the norm of where you're at? What do people behave like? How do they interact with people? If you're in the checkout line in the grocery store and nobody talks to the checkout lady and she seems kind of abrupt and rough and then you'll stand out if you start talking to her. So that could be a little different. What if everybody's talking to her and she's engaging them and then you get up there and they try to engage you and you don't have a conversation. You're going to stand out to her and everybody else. So you have to gauge the environment, the norm around you or the baseline of what's happening. I used an example when I talked about baselines, about Thanksgiving being on a Thursday and how you're a person that when you go weekly grocery shopping, you go on Wednesdays to the grocery store and you go there for specific reasons. You go there because of the time of the day, the day that's available for you. Maybe that's when the sales are on. And you're used to certain patterns. Maybe some things gloss over, but you get the idea of why you're there. You Things that you can count on, that's the norm, that's the baseline. What can you count on habitually? But if you go there the day before Thanksgiving, that baseline, that norm has changed. So it's a little more difficult to move around, to navigate, it throws you off, it stands out. So that's kind of the whole concept. Most of the whole gray man concept has more to do with how you behave, how you interact, the things that you physically do than it has to do with your appearance. Sure, your appearance matters. Sure, the type of vehicle probably matters. But how common is your vehicle? I mean, silver and white vehicles are very, very common. Purple ones are not. But where you're at, that might be common. What kind of vehicle do you have? There's areas where having trucks is very, very common and areas where you don't have trucks, not very common. Let's see. I'll pull this up so I can read it. Got here when the stream is going. Video doesn't have it where YouTube download will download it. Does it need to reel up? I will check that. I do not know. I saw that it was up there before I started this show, so I'll definitely look into that and see. I did see that you had a message on there, so it must have been the same one. So I'll let you know. Worst case scenario, I'll re-record it, which if I fix my technical issues might be a better plan anyway. And then I can make my corrections and have it better. But for those who didn't see it, I just did a live show on using ciphers, encoded messages, simple ways to do it. So anyway, the gray man thing is about being normal, being average, at least in everything you do in your appearance, not physical appearance, everything about you so that you go unmemorable. The idea is that people don't really remember you if something happens. Don't really remember you as a witness or somebody present. Oh, there was a guy and he was kind of tall and kind of had dark clothes on, that kind of thing. You don't just want that because people don't remember things. You want that from people who are trying to remember. You want to be able to go and have a conversation with a random person in a grocery store that's having random conversations with four or five people and you have a longer, more personal conversation with them, but they don't really remember anything about you. That's the goal. So yes, appearance is important. But don't focus solely on appearance. It's why the podcasts I do, the video as I do, I cover many different subjects. Things like preparedness, things like counterintelligence activities that everyday people can do, things about your behavior online and hiding your identity and how to find yourself online. What kind of stuff are you giving away? How are you doing that in everyday life? Next week on Sunday, 6 o'clock Pacific, 9, uh, 9, 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm doing one on pattern analysis, pattern recognition. 
that'll be used for many things to even go further into this. It'll be used for things like how we hunt for terrorists doing pattern recognition and pattern analysis or patterns of life as we call it. How you can use that same idea when you're looking up your own information, whether it's on somebody or just something you want to learn more about or researching the news. But it's mainly, that show's mainly going to be meant for you to look at your own patterns. What patterns do you have? How are they set? Which ones should you keep in place to have a noticeable pattern in life to help you stay gray? Because you can't break them all. But which patterns should you get rid of? What things you look at more for the protection of yourself and your family? Those are all part of the aspects of what a gray man really is. The difference is, in the spy world as we call it, people are trained to do that for months. Then they go and live that way and their lives count on it. And they get additional special training when they need it. But everyday people, we don't get that stuff. And there's not a lot of people out there talking about this. A few have written some books, somewhat dabbling in it, but nobody really talks about this. They just focus on your appearance. I've seen stuff where people say you should only wear this type of pants or you should only wear this color or this color scheme. And none of that is accurate. It will be accurate to certain specific situations, but not all of them. So that's why when you asked about the backpack, I asked those questions and mentioned its appearance. Nothing wrong with having other options. You have many types of clothes probably with many different colors and many different levels of dress based on the occasion. What other objects do you carry with you you could change for that? Just like people who carry firearms. Sometimes they have different ones they carry for different reasons. Some people have different backpacks. Some people have more than one automobile. They use those for different reasons, mainly probably because of where they're going and why. But what other reasons could we use those options? You know, when I buy vehicles as a main everyday driver, I buy common vehicles of common colors that are fairly recognizable in most of the country where I travel, about two-thirds of it, that make it less noticeable. And I look for other vehicles like mine and other colors like mine to see how many I can find. And there's quite a bit of them. And those are just the options that I have. So it just depends on what you're doing. You have to be flexible. You have to realize you can't do it all the time. You can't live the life like a spy. If you do, you'll go crazy or you'll be alone. Yeah, you can protect yourself to that level, but it could be a very stressful and boring life. So that's kind of the whole concept of where it comes from, what it's all about, how I'm trying to share it with other people and get them to understand what it is and get them to find ways to blend in better, be safer, be more situationally aware. What kind of safety aspects are important to you? How to help your kids. How for women or men that are on the run or hiding from somebody or an abusive or stalker or somebody that potentially could be bad, what are the things you can do? Simple examples I give. When people move, they tend to always forward their mail, but that leaves a tracking system in place for people to find you a lot easier. There is a level of difficulty to finding you if when you move, you don't forward your mail. And you just go into everything that matters and individually, like your bank, your credit cards, all that stuff, re-update your new address. I never leave forwarding addresses. I never forward my mail. Realistically, most of the junk is just going to get lost anyway. After a while, usually four or five years, I start getting more junk mail, no matter what. But you get a couple free years, maybe three or four, where you're not getting any junk mail. That's just one simple thing you can do. Other things for situational awareness, I tell people. One of the things you should do as much as possible is when you park a vehicle, park it so it's ready to drive, meaning you pull into your house. Most people park, let's say you don't park in the garage. Garage is a little different. You park in front of your garage, front of your vehicle is pointing at the garage, and then you always back out. I would rather back into my garage, which is what I do. That way, it's easier for me to get out. It's safer. I can see better. I don't have to worry about the rear view mirrors. There's less likelihood of anybody being in my driveway to hit when I back in than there is backing out on a road where people can be not paying attention, driving fast or whatever. Plus, if it's an emergency, you save yourself seconds. If it's an emergency and you're amped up a little bit and don't realize it, you're not paying attention as much. Same thing at a gas pump. If there's three pumps in a row, I never use the middle one. I always park in such a way that I can drive away. And if an option is available, I park my vehicle so that it's facing the farthest pump away from the store not the closest one pointing towards the store. That way I don't have to worry about people and other vehicles getting out. I know people don't pay attention and I want to be able to leave. And then while I'm pumping gas, I look around and see what everybody's doing. So little things like that help with situational awareness. Those are all real, real minor, but they're real simple things you can do to help be more situation aware. When you're pumping gas, no matter how you pump gas, what I tell people to do is you have the nozzle 
in your gas tank, filling up with gas, and stand with your back against the vehicle. It's safer. If anybody wanted to do anything to you, they can only come from your sides or in front of you, which usually has a gas pump and garbage can somewhat blocking their view. And I keep the gas pump on one side of me and my driver's side door on the other. I don't have them both on the same side where I'm near the back of the vehicle. I can pay attention. I can look around. If I briefly want to look over my vehicle, all they're seeing is my head because I'm tall enough for it. If you're not that tall, look through the windows. I can get in the vehicle quickly. I'm paying more attention, and I look like less of a possible target. Because part of being gray is to not look like a target, not to become or look like a victim to somebody that may want to be taking advantage of an opportunity. That's why I tell people things like that. Simple things to do. Just things like money. I never pull out my entire wallet if I don't have to when I carry a wallet. I prep things. Like I have a wallet when I carry it that's got cards and cash in it and IDs. But if I'm going somewhere, I pull out the items I need and put them in another pocket so it's the only thing I'm pulling out so that I don't lose it. Or if somebody wants to take it, I only lose that one item. That's how I do it. That way you're not showing everything you have. Not to mention I could leave everything in my vehicle if I wanted to. Now some people say, well, my vehicle gets stolen. Well, what do you think is more likely, your vehicle to be stolen at the gas station or in a parking lot or anywhere or all the different times you're walking around with a full wallet on your person and how many times you're pulling it out and buying things? How many people are really paying attention to your car versus how many people are paying attention to you and what you pull out of your pocket? Just like when I would gamble and go to the casinos if I won money and I had lots of money. You know, if I won money, say, at a slot machine, I was going to play some more, buy dinner or whatever. Even there, even in Vegas where $100 bills float around like nothing, I would take some of the small bills and put them in another pocket and use those small bills. I wouldn't pull out a wad of cash. I'd only pull it out when I got a place to put it in a safe or put it somewhere more secure just so I wasn't flashing around, just so it wasn't more noticeable. You know, just things like that. Those type of things help. That's part of being gray. Make yourself less attractive, meaning less of an attraction, not less physically attractive. You know, it's just like uh, we always hear about how people pay attention to women because of the way they dress. Sure, we notice them, but you know what else we notice? We notice people that are dressed a certain way because they have to be, like the homeless. If they're homeless long enough, they look and appear a certain way. We notice them because they stand out. Unfortunately, that's how their lives are. You know, you get a really attractive woman wearing some really tight clothes, going in and out of the workout place, and nobody else is dressed like that. Yeah, she's really noticeable no matter why she's wearing that stuff. The idea is to be less noticeable. And I know women that work in this field that are very beautiful, attractive women. But when they go to places like the gym, they're wearing like loose T-shirts and big gym shorts. And unless you get close enough to them or know them, they don't stand out as much as those other women because they don't want to be a target. And the women I know that do that didn't do it because of this job. They did it because of places they've lived and things they've heard and they wanted to make themselves less of an attraction, usually just for being hit on, but sometimes so that they're not targeted in a bad way. So that's all part of the idea. Counterintelligence, all counterintelligence is, is guys that look for spies. So a big part of the gray man thing, half of it's about how you choose to interact with people to gain the advantage. That's human intelligence. The other half is how you choose or not choose to interact with people or stop them from interacting with you. That's counterintelligence. So in one aspect, if you choose to interact with somebody to get something out of it, even if it's just assistance from the waiter, you're trying to use them as an asset, something to your benefit. That's human intelligence. If you're trying to get people to stop looking for you, to stop talking to you, or to not do things that you don't want to happen unless you provoke it, that's counterintelligence. That's all it really is. So when you look for yourself online or listen to the podcast I've done or watch any past or future videos when I talk about that, what you're doing is a counterintelligence activity. That's part of being gray. Who's looking for me? What can people find? Did you know that if you go on Facebook, let's say, and you mark everything as private and unlisted and you can't be found on Google and all this other stuff and nobody can friend you, that you can still be found? How many places can find the records of where you've lived, your old emails and phone numbers? I don't even pay for those services because I know how to find it. But one of the places, there's, you know, if you look up somebody's name, all these websites, and it shows you a little bit hidden information, you pay $1.59 or $9.99, you can look up this many things. There's one out there that I can't think of the name of that actually puts a lot of good information on there without you paying for anything. It has names of utility companies. You can cross-reference to their addresses. Their addresses are complete. 
without zip code. Has everything up through the city, not state or zip code. And it has utility companies, old phone numbers, complete, significant portions of email addresses for you to figure them out. And all that information, there's a guy on YouTube that I know. I don't know him well, but Luke, who's been on some of my shows, we know him. He had moved. And we were decided to try and find him. It took us about 20 minutes to where I had imagery of his new property and where he was and what state and debunked what everybody was thinking. He wasn't telling anybody where he was. I know where he lives. I could go to his house. And it only took about 20 minutes. And it was because of sites like that that were free where I found links to old places he'd work, photos of him, when he had changed this, when he changed that, when he got new phone numbers, Croft restaurants found which ones had recent logins or connections to social media accounts, which ones were most likely to be new, was able to tag him to a specific state, figured out I had lived there before and it made sense to me that that's probably where he was. And then all of a sudden I found the property records of the property he'd only had for about six weeks. And there you had it. I have imagery of his house and I didn't even have the address. So that's part of what all this stuff is, is while there's all these cool things you can do and stories you can hear, most of it's about what can I do to be less noticeable? What can I do to protect myself and my family? What can I do to be less of a target? What can I do to gain the advantage? What can I do to learn more information from people? That's the other stuff I talk about. I talk about things like body language, how to read body language and understand it, how to use it to your advantage how to detect deception, how to talk to somebody and find out if they're being deceptive and recognize whether or not they even realize it and whether or not that deception is actually a lie or if it's not a lie, but it's still deception. Because all lies are deception, but not all deception are actually lies. Figure out what kind of information do they really believe? How do I get them to do things for me or do stuff? Now you can use this to get discounts. I try not to do that and I've turned many of them down, but I have a story I told once about getting a free oil change just from being nice to the guys, all it really sounded like, but I was using the skills I've learned in order to do that. You'll find yourself being able to de-escalate situations and recognize threats, identify threats, figure out how to avoid arguments. All it is when it comes to human intelligence, the bread and butter of human intelligence is working with sources and assets. That's the majority of it as far as the numbers go. It's really about building and establishing relationships and then ending those relationships in a healthy way. Can this translate to your personal life? It can, but when emotions are involved, hard to say. But most guys that do this professionally, their emotions stay out of it. That's why it's hard for a lot of people to do. When I ran an interrogation facility for the U.S. Army and worked with an intelligence agent in an interrogation facility, one of the reasons we got rid of a lot of younger guys that were military was because their emotions got involved. That was the number one thing. Number two, a distant number two, was people that didn't understand the job. So just for trivia, an interrogation, non-law enforcement, you're not looking for a conviction. Most of the time, you're going to already know that they're going to get convicted. A lot of guys you interrogate aren't guilty of anything. Maybe you find something out, but you're really trying to find more information. That's all it is. I want more information on this. I want more information to stop the next attack. I want to know everybody you know. So when you watch TV shows with cops and they're doing something to get the big fish or take down the network, That's what Intel guys are doing all the time, constantly. That's all they want to do. They don't care about locking one guy up. We're going to get that anyway. I don't care if this guy confesses. I'm going to get that anyway if there's something for him to confess. I want to get more. And that's what they do. And they do that by developing, establishing relationships, by building rapport. Just those common niceties and each person wanting to engage in conversation. There's a lot of strategies and tactics involved, some of which can translate outside of an interrogation facility. And it's just understanding how to use those to your advantage. One of the things I used to do on YouTube is I talked interrogation. I haven't really talked it on the podcast at all. I'm actually going to start doing some videos on that, breaking down each method one at a time, giving examples so they're shorter videos instead of having some long three-hour one with a bunch of people and conversations are hard to follow. Breaking down different strategies for conversations, for persuasion and influence coming from spy world, as we call it, that you can use in everyday life. You know, a good example I I use all the time, I know guys that do this, interrogators that have children. So they got two kids. We'll say they're younger, whatever you want to call that, not toddlers, maybe old enough to be on their own. And you come home and something's wrong, like a lamp's broken. And, you know, one's blaming the other. They both got a story. Nobody wants to be guilty. Very common thing. Best thing you can do, make them stop talking. Stick them both in separate rooms. Put them in an uncomfortable room. Don't put them in their room. 
Don't put them in a place where they can play with stuff or watch TV. Put them in a room they're not supposed to be in or not normally supposed to be in that they're already concerned about doing anything wrong. You take kid number one. We'll say it's a girl and boy. You sit the girl down. You go sit down here. Don't do anything. You just stay right here, and I'm going to go talk to your brother. You walk out of that room. You take the brother. You put him in the room. You stay right here. You don't do anything. You wait for me. I'm going to go talk to your sister. You leave that room. Then you let them both sweat. And then you pick one to talk to. And whoever you talk to first, without giving away information or trying to make accusations, you talk like you've already talked to the other one. So let's say you go back to the girl first. Well, I talked to your brother. Let me hear your story. That type of statement says you haven't drawn conclusions yet. You're suggesting to them, you're lying to them, that you've talked to their brother. A lot of interesting things could happen. They could tell you a story. They could ask you what that person said. Things like this happen all the time with detainees. Then you go back out. You go in and talk to the brother who's now the second person. This time you're telling the truth. Just talk to your sister. Tell me what your story is. From there, going back and forth, you can actually get a better picture of truth by finding things that are common and identifiable between the two. You may never know the real truth. Part of it is not drawing conclusions, not making judgments, not trying to pressure them, not scaring them. And you want to do things like get on their level. You're physically bigger than the kids anyway. So if they're sitting on the bed and they're uncomfortable and you're towering over them, that's not building rapport. You want to get down on their level, physically on their level. You want to have no physical barriers. Maybe you sit next to them. Maybe put the arm around them, something to console them. Basically, the old statement, flies with honey. That's how you catch flies. You don't catch flies with vinegar, and vinegar is made from honey. Basically, bad things come from good intentions. Bad results come from, you know, people wanting to do the right thing. You try to make them comfortable. You don't say things to calm them down too much unless they're losing it. You don't say things to make them think you're on their side. And if they want a decision, you don't give it to them. The reason I use children as this example is not only people tried this and thought it was amazing. I use an example because in that world when you're working with people, that's how you have to do it. You have to use skills and strategies like this, but at the same time, you kind of got to talk to them like they're kids. You got to keep it simple. You try not to make accusations. You try not to draw conclusions. You try not to make judgments. You make them believe that you've made no judgments or decisions. You know, you walk in the room and say, I'll just talk to your sister. Well, am I in trouble? Well, tell me your story first. Well, I need to know if I'm in trouble. Well, I need to know your story first before I decide if you are in trouble. So let's start with that. Just tell me the truth. Tell me what happened. And that's what you do. And then you can play them off each other as long as you want. And you may find out what really happened. And it may not be a bad thing. Maybe it is a bad thing. Who knows? Maybe you don't want to do this to your kids because it's manipulation. Totally understandable. But I think you get the concept, the idea of how this would work because that's how we work sources and assets. That's how I talk to people all the time. The idea is to think it out. It gives you time to think. It gives you time to cool off. It gives you time to strategize for the next interaction, the next conversation. Any important conversation I have, I plan it out in my head. And The more important it is, the longer I take. I think about how much do I know about this person? How many conversations have I had? If I say this, what's their likely response based on my knowledge of them, not my assumptions? And I try to come up with my responses so that I'm as prepared as possible. I treat it like a lot of people treat interviews. You're going to go do an interview. There's questions you'll probably be asked, ones that are very common. Which ones should I ask? How should I respond? What are better ways to say this? It gives you time to strategize and think, and that's all it is. It's just simple things like that. It's most people don't put them together. And they don't understand how to use some of these tools. So many things I've taught people say, man, that's so obvious, or man, I should have known that, or you know what, I get that. I probably, I wouldn't have explained it that well, but I think I already do that in this way. It's a way to highlight it for people to get it in their heads and realize, put it all together. They've got all the pieces, even big parts of the puzzle put together. How do I, how do I mash it all together to make it work? And then you can use those tools and strategies. At the end of the day, it's a skill like anything else. It can be taught to anybody. And everybody doesn't mean everybody can do it well, though. It's like an interrogation. Some people would say it was an art. Some people would say it was a skill. It's really both. It's a skill that can be taught, but there is a bit of an art form to it that comes with experience that some people do fine at. and Some people do great at it. It just depends on what you're doing, who you are, what's your skill level, what organization are you working for. It's different working for an intelligence agency wearing civilian clothes where you can do interrogations out while meeting somebody, they don't realize you're actually interrogating them versus being military in a uniform, in a war zone, talking to people that 
your military has been there for years. This is your first time there. And they already have expectations based on stories they've heard or experiences they've already had. And that's kind of how it all plays out. It translates to everything else. And I imagine you have something in your life you can look at to be like, yeah, this is a skill. This is something you could teach anybody. Doesn't mean they'll necessarily learn it or doesn't mean if they learn it, they can do it well. But there's somewhat of an art form to it. Something that may look like an art form based on your level of experience. People that can reach in a toolbox and grab that right size socket or whatever that, I'm not a tool guy. I always use that example, not my thing, but there's like a common socket everybody's probably missing because everybody borrows it. It's one of the most common things. I don't know that, but a lot of guys do. So it just depends on how you work it out and the things that matter to you most and what areas you want to focus on. So I thought I'd do this video. So far, I've had no technical issues. So I think I've fixed, actually, it looks like I've fixed most of my problems, which is good because I thought I was going to buy a new computer. But the idea is to put this video out there for people to watch. So if, for anybody out there watching right now, but if you're watching this video after I do the live show and you've got questions or comments, please post them below. Let me know what your questions are and I will answer them on YouTube. I will do a video like this or throw them in one of my live shows and I will answer your question or direct you to a place that has the answer if I've already created it in order to let your voice be heard and to help you with whatever the reason is you have your question, whether you're trying to develop skills or you're just curious. So for all you on the external, and there's quite a bit of you out there actually. Is there anybody out there that wants to say hi or has a question for me on anything about intelligence, intelligence agency, history of intelligence, the gray man theory, the military? At this point, it's kind of a free open conversation. I'm mentioning that more for my benefit because I'm going to edit this video later and use that first part as a gray man description. Let's see, David Hughes, I am Nemo. Nemo, you should go over the, go over there and try again while you're watching, see if you can get on that Cypher video. So some things I've talked about in the past, since you're still watching, that I'm going to recreate. Some of them are old. Some of the older stuff I have here on YouTube, bad production value. I was using a cheap $200 laptop. And good information, but the way we structured the shows was difficult. They were long. I have the podcast now. So if you like audio podcasts, I have a podcast called Gray Man Hiding in Plain Sight. It's on Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio. It's created through Anchor FM, and it's on about, let's say there's 17 total platforms, so it's on 13 others. Pretty much any podcast app or podcast platform, you can find Gray Man Hiding in Plain Sight. It has the same symbol I use here. Same cover photo, same icon photo. I don't want to butcher your name. Is it Toll Galen? I don't. Mean, I mean, it's probably just a YouTube name. Could be a real name. If some of the best information be a gray man that I've found online, period. I appreciate that. I, I hate saying things. Sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but I don't think there's a lot of guys doing it. Like when you look it up, no matter what spelling you're using, they're they're making one video. Maybe they make one years later. Toll Gallon. Okay, Toll Gallon. Thank you. And. Uh, most of them only know what I say, the appearance thing. It's because they never did it for real. Like, they weren't paid to do it. They weren't trained to do it. You know, human intelligence is a six-month course. It's almost, well, in the military, by definition, it's like four and a half months or something. But with holidays and all that, it works out to about six months. People that train for, like, the CIA, that's at least six months of initial training. And they don't learn everything. They do other schools afterwards, so... Say you worked at the CIA, you go to a place like the farm, you become a case officer, you're going to run assets wherever you're going to work, and you get a mission or a specific assignment, and you need additional training. They're going to put you through it. He's, what he's found is most content is based around the SHTF or without rule of law, blending in then, not actually living that every day. Here's the thing about that. Everything I've seen, they're still getting it wrong, I would say, for those events because they're only focusing on working a certain way. They're making assumptions on how that looks. Now, you can make comparisons to events in parts of the world, but they still aren't going to be universal. There's concepts that will be universal, but what they're doing exactly isn't going to work in all those situations, even throughout history. I mean, when's the last time you watched a movie that you used to like that was made in the 80s? Look at how they talk, how they cut their hair, how they dress. 
You know, there's a lot of things about that just won't fly anymore unless you're going to an 80s party. Oh, yes, what I mentioned, what type of tactical pants and shirt. Oh, I thought you were saying something else. What kind of tactical pants and shirts for everyday wear? So there's a lot of good stuff out there. Um, so I like what people call tactical pants. I really like the cargo pockets. I don't have them on all my pants. Some are actually on the front and not the, not the sides. But not all my pants are like that. You want to think, when clothing comes down to clothing, you want quality clothing that's going to last. And if you think it's something you're going to need for durability, not just everyday wear, but like, let's say you're going to go camping, or let's say one of these SHT events, SHTF. You know, you want to make sure they're made well. Do they breathe well? What types of materials? What kind of threads? How much stitching is on there? There are brands. I, I should go through and look at all my stuff and do a show just on... The brands I use for different things. I would look for general designs. One, you'd have to like them, of course, because you're close. They should be comfortable and fit well. You know, all this sounds like normal clothes stuff. When it comes down to the layout, you know, buttons, zippers, pockets, labels, it's what you're comfortable with. Match it to what you're using it for. Like, what is your everyday life? It's different if your everyday life is... I get up, I work in an office. Those clothes may not work there. I come home, I dress a certain way, I go shopping, I hang around the house. To some degree, most people change the clothes they wear all the time. There are a lot of people that don't. They wear the same thing all the time. Their jobs, careers allow for it, and which is great. What do other people wear? What kind of stuff are other people wearing where you're at at different times and in different situations? If you go to the city park, and there's a fair during the day, or there's one of those fairs, not like for kids, but they have all the tents and they're selling stuff. How do people dress there? What's the time of year? What is noticeable? When you're walking around, what kind of things do you notice? Do you notice the guy that's wearing kind of a cargo short that look more like a dress pant with a too tight fitting polo, no socks, wearing flip flops and cheap sunglasses? If that's something you've noticed, because I've noticed it here a lot, that's something you don't want to do. If you noticed it, other people are noticing it. Do people watching. Do people watching with somebody that, where they don't know what you're doing, but you're trying to learn, figuring out what kind of things stand out. When you're at a place like that, or say you're at the mall and you're in the food court, sit somewhere in the middle. Sit in a way where there's a lot of people around where you can see traffic flow and you're with somebody that likes to talk and that notices people and see what kind of things they notice. Now there's Part of the things they notice because they're looking for them, or that's what they're always looking at. Like guys don't look at shoes. Women look at shoes a lot. Figure those things out. What things matter? But I, I'm sorry I don't have any brands for you. I wish I could tell you the brand of pants I'm wearing now. They're really comfortable. I use Twitter all the time. I have done a couple OSINT training videos. I'm going to do a couple on Twitter and Facebook. Here's what's great about Twitter. It's the most difficult social media platform to shut down. For years, when we went after terrorists through social media, one of the hardest things to do was Twitter. There's certain things about them that I can't get into that make it very difficult to find information. The other thing about Twitter is its primary use is for somebody to tweet a message, just like a text, when something's happening right now. A lot of events that happen, it was real big in the Arab Spring, but anytime there's an overseas event, it involves the public. People are on Twitter. That's how you get your information. There's a website called the One Million Tweet Map, which I'll probably do a video on. I did a recording uh, description on the uh, Intel training page that I have in the show notes there for guys to use, where you can go in and search for all kinds of things and see how many tweets are coming out of a country, a city, a specific area, using keywords. And it's amazing how much stuff is there. Twitter is the only social media platform I think is worth using to find any actual information out on anything. But and that should answer your second question. Twitter is the one thing I would I would focus on. Is there any reading material you recommend for those of us who are not in intelligence, such as PIs or private security? What exactly are you looking for? What kind of subjects or information? Um, there's books. Uh, there's a guy named Mike Basil, spelled with two Zs, who has some books that have to do with these subjects you might be interested in. In fact, hold on one second here. One I, I was looking at, I think he has a couple versions. It's called The Complete Privacy and Security Desk Reference. Now, he updates that one a lot because things change. 
that might be good for you. It shows a lot of things about websites, different ways to look people up through social media. It talks about ways you can hide your identity, whether or not you're using prepaid credit cards or cash, how to use different apps for things like Uber to hide your identity and which ones you can and can't use. Um, things about your mail, your phone, email, online presence. That might be really good for you. If there's something else specific, let me know. I do have quite a bit of books. I actually need to move my library in here in a way that I can read the titles. Because if I see the title, I know it's in the book. But I can't think of it off the top of my head. Jack Walsh, how you doing? Greetings from the left coast. I am in the southwest, so west-ish coast. There are books about hiding your identity that sound specific, but they're not all good. Um, I've read quite a few of those. I think that book will help you. He has several other books you might be interested in that have to do with open source intelligence. On my channel here, um, I got a couple things I did, one on a search engine called Carrot2, one on open knowledge maps that are different ways to look up information. Don't know that those would help you. Open knowledge maps is about um, life sciences, natural sciences. At least those are the sources, but you can find plenty of other information on there. I show examples in the video of other information you can find. Carrot 2 clusters information from an aggregate a different way based on what you're looking for. It's a better one to use different types of um, keyword searches. I can't, I can't think of the term for it, but we're Boolean searches. So like if you go into Google or something and you gives you the directions on whether or not you should put quotes or put and or minus ways to change. You know, I'm looking for everything about changing a tire without this. There's ways you can put those in there with pluses and minuses and all this other stuff. I actually have on that Intel training page, I have some posts about that. Uh, several that show different techniques you can use, different places to look, better places to find pictures and find out if images are real, better places to use map searches. That's mainly what the Intel training page is for. Uh, a $2 subscription a month gets you some audio and video podcasts I don't put anywhere else. There's only a couple I put on YouTube, like those training videos I put on YouTube about a month after I make them, about a month after they've been on the Intel page. But every day I put one or more things on there that are free training information. I also put on situational or uh, situation reports, stuff I get or make on things going on in the world people might be interested in or in this country. And some of that, I when I research stuff, I use Twitter just to hit that question again. If her power falls off, I figured it out. But Twitter, yeah, Twitter is a great tool. You got any other questions out there? I'm trying to think of other books. But I don't have any around me. But yeah, Mike Basil, I don't know what his website's called. It's not Mike Basil. I think he has a podcast. Um, there's probably some information on there that might help you out. I'm not sure what else you would you would be interested in. Things like if you're doing surveillance, I hope you know what you're doing. I've done discussions on surveillance and counter surveillance and how it little bits about how it's done, how to avoid it, things to do to prepare yourself more for counter surveillance than surveillance. There's some early podcasts on the Gray Man Hiding in Plain Sight where I talk about that quite a bit. Oh yes, that's what it is. Inteltechniques.com. Link relationships. Do, uh, there is. There, there, uh, it'd take me too long to find it while I'm on the live show. But I will find that for you. There is an actual website people have been using that's free that builds those link diagrams for you and lets you adjust them if you want to go in and start putting information. But actual link diagrams are done by people. That's a big thing what analysts do or the types of link diagrams. Just like you see in movies and TV shows where they have pictures and post-it notes on the wall and they're using yarn. It's always in some detective show. That's legit. I mean, people do stuff like that. More of it's done on the computer now. But it's finding out a way, how are all these people connected? How are you going to label those connections and watch ways in order to you have a visual for it so you can plan what you're going to do, figure out which ones you rank, how important are they? Oh, I didn't realize that this guy is connected to this guy through this person or through this person in this location, or these two people, or these two locations. What is the likelihood they could run into each other? Could they actually be communicating? There's ways that they kind of describe that when they walk it through, when they do detective shows, where I'm like, they don't show how it was built and describe it, but when they say they're connected this way and this way, you know, that's how the scripting's done, but that's how you figure those things out. 
So cryptocurrencies are changing. David's more of an expert. David from DMR Publications is his DMR PUB, DMR Pub. That's his YouTube channel. He does a podcast called The Discreetable Thoughts and Philosophies of DMR Publications. On his website, dmrpublications.com, he actually has some good crypto information. The thing with crypto is I don't know enough about all the different types, but there's different ways they can be tracked. There has been terrorism financing that has gone through crypto. Part of the things that we're seeing now about crypto on the news and whether or not the SEC is doing this or regulations are going this way, part of that is intelligence-driven, government-driven in order to find people who are having a hard time finding or finding their funding. Going after the money is one of the best things you can do when fighting things like terrorism. Not only you take their money away, but it's going to link you to more people, more ways smuggling's happening. It, it's the one subject that links to pretty much everything, whereas everything else links to many things, but not everything. The money always does. So it can be hard hard to track. The questions are, you know, what country are you in? Everybody has different rules. How did you register that account? What app site or program are you using as a wallet? What security does it have? You know, what company are they for? How easy is it for somebody to get in there? Not just a hacker, but also, say, the government. It depends on what you're using it for. How are you choosing to move that money? And uh, can, I don't know this answer, but just like you could start your own LLC or especially a trust fund, especially if you have a double blind trust to own property and stuff to help protect yourself and hide yourself, I don't know if that can be done with crypto. That would be interesting if it could. It would make it more secure for you to move money around. I doubt that it can be done to the degree it can with property, but that definitely be something to look into. Crypto is great though, because depending on the system you're using relatively quickly or within an hour, you can move any amount of money, any distance in the same amount of time. In the world of terrorism, and it's not just terrorists, it actually was predates most of terrorism, another thing called Hawala Deers. What they would do is you'd have a Hawala deer, kind of like a banker. And let's say you're going from point A to point B over a great distance or paying a debt over a great distance. Usually it's used for traveling. You'd give the Hawala deer money. So let's say you're in a third world country to have Hawala deers. Say you're a Bedouin. This is how it was originally used. You don't have, you know, it's not secure to travel. People get attacked. This is where the idea came from. They'd give the Hawala deer, say, $10,000 or whatever they'd give them. That Hawala deer would call the Hawala deer where you're going and say, hey, this person shows up. This is who they are, how you identify them. You need to give them $10,000. Then you'd show up there. The money would ever never, never physically move. It wouldn't even physically move through digital means. But the guys had enough money and things set in place. That's how it worked. You can do that with people. It's the same idea as transferring information. But that's what they had, and that's the same idea of what crypto does just crypto is digital. It's not a real thing. I mean, it's not physical. You can't touch it. You can transfer it in and out of other accounts. You can turn it into money or into currency. You know, you can get it sent to your bank account. But it's a great way to uh, move money around. Another thing about money I tell people is I did a recent podcast on hiding in plain sight talking about preparedness. You might want to listen to I talk about money in there and how I originally plan my preparedness for an emergency situation and how I use different types of credit cards, money, how I figured that out, how I would use it. That might be something you'd be interested in. I would definitely go check that out. I probably will do another podcast or video in the future where I talk more in depth about different ways to use money and currencies to protect what you have, move things around, be safer, have more options. I'm kind of a big fan of that. So that might be something you're really interested in. All right, we got more people. Hope you're all having a good time out there. Let's see. Oops, I was trying to see how long we'd been on for. Well, if anybody knows, you can definitely tell me. Oh, almost an hour. Actually, I remember what time I started. Do you think the hack Russia did in the 11 Olympics practice for the hack in 20? Nine years apart, probably not. Um, first, it depends on who did it. I mean, just because it came out of the country, was it the country, was it a private organization, was it a private hacker? We often attribute locations to things like happening, meaning that government has evolved, and we typically as Americans do it when it's China or 
Russia, that's not always fair. It's definitely more fair with China, but not as much with Russia. Nine years apart, the development of the technology, hackers and things they've done, probably not. Um, a big intelligence operation would take that long. But what you should watch is a movie called Zero Days. It is on several services and streaming services. Look around. It's on YouTube, too. Somewhere it's going to be for free. It has to do with Operation Olympic Games. Most people know it's the Stuxnet virus that had to do with the Iranian nuclear facility where we took it down and sent them back a few years. What you'll see in there that might help answer your question because they talk to directors of intelligence, intelligence officers. They talk to guys from Kropinski. They talk to the two guys that mainly found it. And they discuss the physical size of it, how long it probably took to make, the things it was capable of, and how much it scared them. And this was when they found it 15 years ago, probably. And one of the things you can derive from that, especially if you watch it more than once and really pay attention to it, is more than likely that was in the making for well over a decade, probably started in the 90s. And then ask yourself, what can we do now? And then re- at the end of it, they'll tell you I was part of, it was called Operation Olympic Games. Stuckness was part of Operation Olympic Games. Operation Olympic Games was part of something much bigger. And it was a multi-company country operation. Something like the ones you're mentioning were, while significant, smaller in size and scale, I don't think that far apart that that's likely how it did. I'm guessing if they had to do a test run, they would have done it something smaller. One of the things I learned that was interesting is a lot of guys that would do this stuff, by a lot of guys and being vague on purpose, they test it on their own whatevers in a safe way. They recreate the scenarios. So you think from like a military law enforcement aspect, you're going to go in to do, say, a hostage rescue. You get all this intel. You recreate the scene and scenario, the house, the layout. You go in and practice it over and over again, but it's in a safe environment. Eventually move up to using real bullets probably. Same kind of thing. Some guys... Some governments do that to the point where they try it out on their own people and not in a nefarious way. They try it on on their own technologies, recreate the situation in a safe manner to make sure that it's going to work. Social media is tools outside of Twitter. So it depends on how you're using them and what they're designed for and what information you're getting. Like Facebook's great for finding photos of people. Those photos can tell you a lot about where they're at and what they're doing. A lot of body language in them especially with videos. You can find out personal information they put up there if they choose to put in their education, all that stuff. You can do that on a lot of different social medias. For for more current stuff that's going on, Twitter is by far better, but you can use those other tools. I think you get more out of Twitter. I think it's more researchable. I think it's more relevant most of the time, especially on current big events. When the inauguration happened, I was assisting an organization with, kind of doing observation intel, I'll call it. And the one thing I was using was a Twitter resource tool, tracking keywords and phrases all around the country, but specifically around D.C., Virginia, Maryland. And I was watching security camera feeds all around the Capitol grounds and the White House. And I started analyzing patterns of movement of certain vehicles. I was identifying which uh, moving van type trucks actually were tactical vehicles with tactical teams inside which vehicles could have been suspicious and turned out they weren't. I was tracking all that and I was getting most of my information from Twitter. So you can use all those other resources. There's plenty of options of information they have available on them, but it just depends on what it is. Like I don't think there's any value at looking at people's posts, especially when it has something to do with media news, pop culture, any of that stuff, whether they put anything in there or not, I'm sure you've probably seen people make comments and based on their comments, you realize you didn't click the leak, read anything. So I use Facebook and Twitter for the gray man concepts and I put stuff up there. I started doing it more infrequently because I leave people's comments unless they're way out of line or asking for violence or something crazy like that. But nobody reads the stuff. A few people do. That's why I keep doing it. But, you know, 13, 15,000 followers on Facebook, enough people are reading the material and asking questions. I keep doing it. But so many people occasionally just throw some just – vicious or ignorant stuff out there and reading is like you only read the headlines so when you see that stuff you got to read it and you have to evaluate those sources like where's it coming from what website just because it's cnn doesn't mean it's bad just because it's conservative blog doesn't mean it's good who are those people what are their sources can you research those sources and see how they got this information to draw this conclusion are they writing it in a way to make you believe something to tell you to draw a conclusion 
Because that's not journalism or information. They should be giving you information to make a decision. They shouldn't be telling you what decision to make and that it's already decided. One of the things I tell people when you're looking at stuff like that, drop the adjectives. Paste in a Word document, go through and delete all the adjectives and reread it. it may not be radically accurate, but all of a sudden, the story changes when the average or the a, uh, unnecessary adjectives disappear. Counter surveillance is something of interest. Very curious on how techniques I employ stack in comparison to larger agency things to build greater understanding of philosophies of use. I guess I would need to know the stuff you're using and see if there's something I can help you improve upon. Otherwise, I can talk about some things. I'm not going to do it right now because I'm not prepared for it. But I can do a show on counter surveillance. It's on my list of things to do of ways that uh, people can do that in their everyday life that may help you. And for you, it may help you not just for yourself, but realizing as kind of a check on yourself. You know, if somebody did this, how could I do it better? Or am I giving somebody an opportunity to do this? You know, what kind of things can you look for? You know, surveillance is best done in teams. I imagine as a PI that can be difficult at times. Um, there's not too many guys with the skills that can do it by themselves anymore. The more you can do it from a distance is better. But, of course, there's going to be times you can't do it from a distance. It's great if you can sit somewhere in a darkened room with the right camera and telephoto lens to do the surveillance you need to do, as long as it doesn't look real bad and you don't get arrested. But sometimes you can't do that. And I, I realize those things. I think one of the best advantages PIs have today is the amount of information you can get off the Internet. That 10 years ago was much less. But, man, if you're doing this in the 80s, would you even own a computer? You know, when you got one in your hand, you got a smartphone. You know, would they say the first smartphone or first iPod was the same computing power as launching the first space shuttle or something like that? Whatever that trivia is. It has to be true. NASA said it. That's what I heard. I don't know. But now you got a smartphone that has a massively larger hard drive than the first, like, three computers I ever owned. So you have that's your, your biggest advantage. Things you should look into, though, you might be interested in is, are there... Places you would normally go or may be going in the future. Are there public security cameras you can get access to? Just like I can look at the ones in the Capitol grounds. There's places that still have publicly available systems if you know what websites to go to and look in. Those may be helpful to you. Those are things to think about. Other things to consider too are if uh, you're doing surveillance or considering counter surveillance, say you're going to do surveillance and you're going to go do surveillance at night when the sun's down. It's great if you're able to go recon that during the day when the sun's up, but if the opportunity's there, you need to research it in the correct environment when there's no sun so you can see the differences. Where do these artificial lights cause, you know, where do they cause shadows? What places have more or less reflections? You know, I can see into this restaurant great during the day, but I can't see it at night. I can see it great at night, but I can't see it during the day. So best as possible, recreate the environment if you're able to do it. And then if you find a consistent set of locations that you're using regularly you have plenty more time based on your experience to recon those and figure out what you can uh, use to your advantage the next time you're there toll gallon something i've found useful practicing observation is going to walmart target and seeing if i can identify the plain clothes asset protection guys do you have any other better ideas that podcast gray man hiding in plain sight the second one i did is actually called 0100 is the intro. It's called Situational Awareness, How to Protect the Future. Starts out with some things you can do that have to do more with paying attention to your body with situational awareness, but it advances to techniques and things you can do in like restaurants and stores, different ways to orient yourself, how to work with your hearing, how to work with your eyesight, how to start finding layers of conversations, following two or more conversations at once, how to figure out where it's coming from. And that can help you too. Eyes are great. But it's amazing what you can do with your ears. Whether you've ever done it or not, the whole idea of like meditation, closing your eyes, you know, um, whatever, but you're hearing things around you. You know, have you ever just sat in your house with everything off and just sat there and closed your eyes and listened? Or do you do it if you go outside or go camping? You know, and people don't realize how much their ears pick up. People with kids do when their ears aren't picking up something. One of the examples I use, it's too quiet, kids are in trouble. They don't realize there's a certain amount of ambient noise, even if it's from the kids. When it's gone, it clicks because their brain recognizes I'm not getting this input. You can do the reverse and train yourself to isolate inputs from multiple ones you're getting. Because you walk through the mall, may not be loud, but there's more noise there. 
bunch of people walking, doors are opening, checkouts are going, people are buying food, people are talking, even if it's all quiet, there's so much more input. What if you could train yourself to isolate specific signals to hear? And I cover that in that show a little bit on things you can do to isolate those sounds and figure out who is saying this, who are they? There's practical exercise in there. Without looking at them and you're hearing something, what can you figure out about them to your best ability? And then you look at them and say, I was right about this, I was wrong about this. It's not just your eyes deceive you. Most of the things that we input consciously in our brain comes from eyes. Just think movies and TV. I even watch movies in closed caption in foreign languages. Sometimes I have the audio off just because I like the movies and I can focus more on what I'm, I'm seeing. But we don't realize that a lot of the things that our own biases and assumptions, no matter how we learn them, typically came from a visual input. Some of it's going to come from an audio input, like somebody tells you, your parents say this one thing to you your whole life and you believe it. But a lot of it's our visual input. Part of the reason I do that training in that video is to get you to get rid of that visual input try to focus more on your audio and your hearing. Great thing about that. You start training yourself to use your ears more often or in isolated situations as your primary source of information for input and using your eyes secondary. You'll start getting more stuff on your peripheral. When it goes into body language, you'll start realizing that you can hear a conversation, participate in a conversation and start mentally processing the words being spoken to look for deception And your eyes will start picking up as a secondary their physical body movements. I tend to try to teach people that stuff that way. If I teach them how to read body language as best I can, there's assumptions and things they'll make or things that tend to mean this probably most of the time. And they'll go with that because they know that statement. But they completely like normal just blocked out their ears and didn't hear what the conversation was and say, yes, by itself, these two body movements suggest this, however, comma. Here was the conversation. Here's the words being spoken. It changes the meaning. So I hope that helps you. I think it will. And I I did a, another situation awareness one recently that has some different stuff in there. But that, that first one that I recorded about a year ago, I think you'll like that. I think that'll help you out quite a bit. You got any other questions? We're going on, oh, yeah, one hour and seven minutes it shows me. Trying to generally keep these as an hour. I do appreciate your questions. If nothing else pops up. So what I do too, for anybody that's new on the channel, I've already got a show scheduled for next Sunday. I mentioned that I'm going to be doing those every Sunday. I'll at least have the next following one up so that when I'm doing a current show, I can announce it. Just like I mentioned, the next one's on patterns. Occasionally I'll do one where I teach skills. Mostly it'll be conversations like this. I do have guests on depending on the subject. I have already talked to Luke and David. I'm going to do a gray man versus law enforcement, talking to Luke, who's a career law enforcement professional, looking at things like body language, deception, interactions, privacy, security, based on his experience versus mine. I'm going to be doing some with David and Luke, where I do both of them together. That has to do mainly on home security, physical home security and things you can do. So having a cop dealing with legal situations, altercations, conversations you can have. David does have expertise in security systems and home security as well, the other types of security, homeland security. And I'll be doing stuff that are more tips and tricks, things people don't normally think about. David and I already talked about possibly doing some area study ones, um, kind of spread out, like we're talking about doing one about China, not economy as much as focus on the current activities and espionage, as well as our activities around Taiwan, Philippines, Australia, South China Sea, activities that they are currently doing and what they mean, how they contributed to the past and the future. Yeah, so Luke just moved. That's why he's been unavailable. He moved. He got a great job opportunity. Had to leave abruptly, and he's been out of the net. He couldn't be on a show. He was packing his house. Like a week later, he left. He just got to where he's going yesterday or the day before, and then he's going to start working his new job here pretty quick. So I I would like to get him on next Sunday. I'm going to let him look at that show and see if I can get him on there. Uh, but if I can't, then it'll probably be on the next one, depending on what it is. Also, because he has a new job, we have to see what shift he's going to work because of the time change and then how that plays out with whether or not he can be on. The other thing I've considered doing, though, I'm going to definitely do every Sunday. But just like I did this follow-up one, most to test my equipment, what I mentioned on the previous show I did tonight, 
If there's enough questions in air action, especially if they're off the topic I'm trying to focus on, I'll probably do another follow-up like I'm doing this one. But I can also do live shows on a whim without much of an announcement on any day of the week. So if it works out with Luke's job that I can only get him at certain times, I won't have him on my Sunday shows. We'll pick another time to do them, whether it's um, consistent, like say it's every Thursday at 4 o'clock Pacific, or if it's, you know, whatever day. We'll try to match that up to work with him. David's pretty free and open to do it. He's just working on his dissertation. And he just crossed another hurdle with it. And he'll be working on that most of the year, plus the other stuff he's doing. And uh, they try to come on, and I try to have them on when it's best to have them on for what I'm talking about. But like tonight's show about the ciphers and encoded messages, neither one of them would want to be on there, didn't want to be on there because it's not something they have a lot of experience in. They don't want to be on there just to be there. They want to contribute. That's why I've had discussions with them about, here's some things I want to do. What do you think about it? Would you be interested? How can we fit you your your experience into this? Like I did it with David, just trying to figure out ways to title and word the descriptions to make sure it made sense with where my goals are. So when we do stuff with each other, we try to tailor it and match what that person needs on their channel. So that's why when I David did, he's doing his anchor podcast now, but he broadcasts it every Saturday. Um, what he does, he goes, for those who are interested, if you go to DMR Pub, you'll see his podcast. If you watch it, he'll come on, see who's on there. He'll talk for five to 15 minutes with him. And then he'll tell you, hey, I'm going to go live on the podcast. The YouTube live feed stays up. He plays this commercial he made. He does his podcast, lasts about an hour. Then he'll end the podcast, the recording for the audio podcast, but he stays on YouTube. And then he goes through the chat, like I'm reading here, and starts to answer questions. And so I may get into that eventually. But when he used to do other shows, and if he does, I go on there sometimes and it's something I can talk about. I've done leadership, team building. We've done stuff on the Middle East and terrorism, things that I have expertise in. Same thing when Luke did his shows. I don't know if Luke's going to do them again, but he's thinking about an audio podcast based on his law enforcement experiences. He just doesn't have the availability right now. I thank you for the thumbs up. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. That'd be great. Helps with the algorithm for people to find the information. Definitely leave a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe. And on any YouTube channel you follow, if you click the bell, if you really want to get notifications, you have to change it to all. It defaults to personalized based on your YouTube activity. Because of that change, odds are you won't get notified about everything. It depends on what you're doing. You can watch stuff like this all week long, and if next week you watch video games for two hours and nothing else, you probably won't get the next notification. So make sure on any YouTube channel you click the bell and select all if you definitely want to be notified. I'm going to be doing every Sunday shows. I'm starting to do training classes and then some of my older videos that are too long and difficult to see. I'm going to be taking pieces of those out and re-releasing them as shorter clips for people to enjoy very specific subjects in a short amount of time. Thank you guys for coming on. They've been on here tonight. And I will see you on Sunday if I don't do anything sooner.